Hi everyone, it's Michelle Pinheiro again with AHC. We're on part two of Esperanza Rising, our book for this summer's book club for the theme of empowerment. Just to summarize what's happened so far in part one, uh, Esperanza's father was killed by some bandits. Esperanza's uncle um, tried to propose to her mom and says he's gonna make life difficult for her since he owns the land that their house is on. So we're gonna see what happens next. So let's keep reading here. Los Eagles, figs. The wind blew hard that night and the house moaned and whistled. Instead of dreaming of birthday songs, Esperanza's sleep was filled with nightmares. An enormous bear was chasing her, getting closer and closer and finally folding her in a tight embrace. Its fur caught in her mouth, making it hard to breathe. Someone tried to pull the bear away, but couldn't. The bear squeezed harder until it was smothering Esperanza. Then when she thought she would suffocate, the bear grabbed her by the shoulders and shook her until her head wagged back and forth. Her eyes opened and then closed again. She realized she was dreaming and for an instant she felt relieved. But the shaking began again, harder this time. Someone was calling her. Esperanza, she opened her eyes. Esperanza, wake up, screamed Mama. The house is on fire. Smoke drifted into the room. Mama, what's happening? Get up, Esperanza. We must get Abuelita. Esperanza heard Alfonso's deep voice yelling from somewhere downstairs. Senora Ortega, Esperanza. Here, we are here, called Mama, grabbing a damp rag from the wash bowl and handing it to Esperanza to put over her mouth and nose. Esperanza swung around in a circle looking for something, anything to save. She grabbed the doll. Then she and Mama hurried down the hall toward Abuelita's room, but it was empty. Alfonso, screamed Mama. Abuelita is not here. We will find her. You must come now. The stairs are beginning to burn. Hurry. Esperanza held the towel over her face and looked down the stairs. Curtains flamed up the walls. The house was enveloped in a fog that thickened toward the ceiling. Mama and Esperanza crouched down the stairs where Alfonso was waiting to lead them out through the kitchen. In the courtyard, the wooden gates were open. Near the stables, the vaqueros were releasing the horses from the corrals. Servants scurried everywhere. Where were they going? Where's Abuelita? Abuelita, cried Mama. Esperanza felt dizzy. Nothing seemed real. Was she still dreaming? Was this her own imagination gone wild? Miguel grabbed her. Where's your mother and Abuelita? Esperanza whimpered and looked toward Mama. He left her, stopped at Mama, then ran toward the house. The wind caught the sparks from the house and carried them to the stables. Esperanza stood in the middle of it all, watching the outline of her home silhouetted in flames against the night sky. Someone wrapped a blanket around her. Was she cold? She did not know. Miguel ran out of the burning house carrying Abuelita in his arms. He laid her down and Hortensia screamed. The back of his shirt was on fire. Alfonso tackled him, rolling him over and over on the ground until the fire was out. Miguel stood up and slowly took off the blackened shirt. He wasn't badly burned. Mama cradled Abuelita in her arms. Mama, said Esperanza, is she? No, she is alive, but weak, and her ankle, I don't think she can walk, said Mama. Esperanza knelt down. Abuelita, where were you? Her grandmother held up the cloth bag with her crocheting and after some minutes of coughing whispered, we must have something to do while we wait. The fire's anger could not be contained. It spread to the grapes. The flames ran along the deliberate rows of the vines like long curved fingers reaching for the horizon, lighting the night sky. Esperanza stood as if in a trance and watched El Rancho de las Rosas burn. Mama, Abuelita, and Esperanza slept in the servants' cabins. They really didn't sleep much, but they didn't cry either. They were numb, as if encased in a thick skin that nothing could penetrate. And there was no point in talking about how it happened. They all knew that the uncles had arranged the fire. At dawn, still in her nightgown, Esperanza went out among the rubble. Avoiding the smoldering piles, she picked through the black wood, hoping to find something to salvage. She sat on an adobe block near what used to be the front door and looked over at Papa's rose garden. Flowerless stems were covered in soot. Dazed and hugging herself, Esperanza surveyed the surviving victims, the twisted forms of wrought iron chairs, unharmed cast iron skillets, and the mortars and pestles from the kitchen that were made from lava rock and refused to burn. Then she saw the remains of the trunk that used to sit at the foot of her bed, the metal strap still intact. She stood up and hurried toward it, hoping for un milagro, a miracle. She looked closely, but all that remained were black cinders. There was nothing left inside for some day. Esperanza saw her uncles approaching on horseback and ran to tell the others. 
Mama waited on the steps of the cabin with her arms crossed, looking like a fierce statue. Alfonso Hortense and Miguel stood nearby. Ramona, said Tio Marco, remaining on his horse, another sadness in so short a time. We are deeply sorry. I have come to give you another chance, said Tio Luis. If you reconsider my proposal, I will build a bigger, more beautiful house, and I will replant everything. Of course, if you prefer, you can live here with the servants, as long as another tragedy does not happen to their homes as well. There is no main house or fields where they can work. So you see that many people's lives and jobs depend on you. And I'm not sure you, and I'm sure you want the best for Esperanza, do you not? Mama did not speak for several moments. She looked around at the servants who had gathered. Now her face did not seem so fierce and her eyes were damp. Esperanza wondered where the servants would go when Mama told Tio Luis no. Mama looked at Esperanza with eyes that said, forgive me. Then she dropped her head and stared at the ground. I will consider your proposal, said Mama. Tio Luis smiled. I am delighted. I have no doubt that you will make the right decision. I will be back in a few days for your answer. Mama, no, said Esperanza. She turned to Tio Luis and said, I hate you. Tio Luis ignored her. And Ramona, if Esperanza is to be my daughter, she must have better manners. In fact, today I will look into boarding schools where they can teach her to act like a lady. Then he turned his horse, dug his spurs into the animal and rode away. Esperanza began to weep. She grabbed Mama's arm and said, why, why did you tell him that? But Mama was not listening to her. She was looking up as if consulting the angels. Finally, she said, Alfonso, Hortensia, we must talk with Abuelita. Esperanza and Miguel, come inside. You were old enough to hear the discussions. But Mama, Mama took Esperanza by the shoulders and faced her. Mija, my daughter, do not worry. I know what I am doing. They all crowded into Hortensia and Alfonso's tiny bedroom where Abuelita was resting, her swollen ankle propped on pillows. Esperanza saw, sat on Abuelita's bed while Mama and the others stood. Alfonso, what are my options, said Mama. If you don't intend to marry him, Senora, you cannot stay here. He would burn down the servants' quarters next. There will be no income because there are no grapes. You would have to depend on the charity of others and they would be afraid to help you. You could move to some other part of Mexico, but in poverty. Luis's influence is far reaching. The room was quiet. Mama looked out the window and tapped her fingers on the wooden sill. Hortensia went to Mama's side and touched her arm. You should know that we have decided to go to the United States. Alfonso's brother has been writing to us about the big farm in California where he works now. He can arrange jobs and a cabin for us too. We are sending the letter tomorrow. Mama turned and looked at Abuelita. With no words spoken, Abuelita nodded. What if Esperanza and I went with you to the United States, said Mama. Mama, we cannot leave Abuelita. Abuelita put her hand on Esperanza's. I would come later when I am stronger. But my friends in my school, we can't just leave. And Papa, what would he think? What should we do, Esperanza? Do you think Papa would want me to marry Tio Luis and let him send you to a school in another city? Esperanza felt confused. Her uncle said he would replace everything as it was, but she could not imagine Mama being married to anyone but Papa. She looked at Mama's face and saw sadness, worry, and pain. Mama would do anything for her. But if Mama married Tio Luis, she knew that everything would not really be as it was. Tia Luis would send her away and she and Mama wouldn't even be together. No, she whispered. You are sure that you wanna go with us, said Hortensia. I am sure, said Mama, her voice stronger. But crossing the border is more difficult these days. You have your papers, but ours were lost in the fire and they forbid anyone to enter without a visa. I will arrange it, said Abuelita. My sisters in the convent, they can discreetly get you duplicates. No one could know about this, Senora, said Alfonso. We would all have to keep it a secret if you come. This will be a great insult to Luis. If he finds out, he will prevent you from leaving the territory. A tiny smile appeared on Mama's tired face. Yes, it would be a great insult to him, wouldn't it? In California, there is only field work, said Miguel. I am stronger than you think, said Mama. We will help each other. Hortensia put her arm around Mama. Abuelita squeezed Esperanza's hand. Do not be afraid to start over. When I was your age, I left Spain with my mother, father, and sisters. A Mexican official had offered my father a job here in Mexico, so we came. We had to take several ships and the journey lasted months. When we arrived, nothing was as promised. There were many hard times, but life was also exciting. And we had each other. Esperanza, do you remember the story of the phoenix, the lovely bird that is reborn from its own ashes? Esperanza nodded. Abuelita had read it to her many times from a book of myths. We are like the phoenix, said Abuelita, rising again with a new life ahead of us. When she realized she was crying, Esperanza wiped her eyes with her shawl. 
Yes, she thought, they could have a home in California, a beautiful home. Alfonso and Hortensia and Miguel could take care of them and they'd be rid of the uncles. And Abuelita would join them as soon as she was well. Still sniffling and caught up in their affection and strength, Esperanza said, and, and I could work too. They all looked at her and for the first time since Papa died, everyone laughed. The next day, Abuelita's sisters came for her in a wagon. The nuns, dressed in their black and white habits, gently lifted Abuelita into the back. They pulled a blanket under her chin and Esperanza went to her and held her hand. She remembered the night that Alfonso and Miguel brought Papa home in the wagon. How long ago was that? She knew that it had only been a few weeks, but it seemed like many lifetimes ago. Esperanza tenderly hugged and kissed Abuelita. Mi nieta, we won't be able to communicate. The mail is unpredictable and I'm sure your uncles will be watching my correspondence. But I will come, of that you can be certain. While you are waiting, finish this for me. She handed Esperanza the bun bundle of crocheting. Look at the zigzag of the blanket, mountains and valleys. Right now you are in the bottom of the valley and your problems loom big around you. But soon you will be at the top of a mountain again. After you have lived many mountains and valleys, we will be together. Through her tears, Esperanza said, please get well, please come to us, I promise. And you promise to take care of mama for me. Next, it was mama's turn. Esperanza could not watch. She buried her head in Hortensia's shoulder until she heard the wagon pulling it away. Then she went to mama and put her arms around her. They watched the wagon disappear down the path until it was a speck in the distance, until even the dust was gone. That's when Esperanza noticed the old trunk with the leather straps that the nuns had left. What is in the trunk, she asked. Our papers to travel and clothes from the poor box at the convent. The poor box? People donate them, said Mama, for others who cannot afford to buy their own. Mama, at a time like this, must we worry about some poor family who needs clothes? Esperanza said, Mama, we have little money and Hortensia, Alfonso, and Miguel are no longer our servants. We are indebted to them for our finances and our future. And that trunk of clothes for the poor? Esperanza, it is for us. Senor Rodriguez was the only person they could trust. He came after dark for secret meetings, always carrying a basket of figs for the grieving family to disguise his real re reason for visiting. Esperanza fell asleep each night on a blanket on the floor, listening to the adults' hushed voices and mysterious plans, and smelling the plentiful piles of white figs that she knew would never be eaten. At the end of the week, Esperanza was sitting on the small step to Hortensia in Alfonso's cabin when Theo Luis rode up. He remained on his horse and sent Alfonso to bring Mama. In a few moments, Mama walked toward them, drying her hands on her apron. She held her head high and looked beautiful, even dressed in the old clothes from the poor box. Luis, I have considered your proposal, and in the interest of the servants in Esperanza, I will marry you in due time, but you must begin replanting and rebuilding immediately, as the servants need their jobs. Esperanza was quiet and stared at the dirt, hiding the smirk on her face. Theo Luis could not contain his grin. He sat up straighter. I knew you would come to your senses, Ramona. I will announce the engagement at once. Mama nodded, almost bowing. One more thing, she said. We will need a wagon to visit Abuelita. She is at the convent in La Purisima. I must see to her every few weeks. I will send one over this afternoon, said Theo Luis, smiling. A new one. And those clothes, Ramona, they are not fitting for a woman of your stature. And Esperanza looks like a waif. I will send a dressmaker next week with new fabrics. In the nicest way possible, Esperanza looked up and said, thank you, Theo Luis. I am happy that you will be taking care of us. Yes, of course, he said, not even glancing at her. Esperanza smiled at him anyway, because she knew she would never spend a night in the same house with him, and he would never be her stepfather. She almost wished she would be able to see his face when he realized that they had escaped. He wouldn't be grinning like a proud rooster then. The night before the dressmaker was scheduled to come, Mama woke Esperanza in the middle of the night and they left with only what they could carry. Esperanza held a valise filled with clothes, a small package of tamales, and her doll from Papa. She and Mama and Hortensia were wrapped in dark shawls to blend in with the night. They could not take a chance of walking on the roads, so Miguel and Alfonso led them through the grape rows, weaving across Papa's land toward the Rodriguez Ranch. There was enough moonlight so that they could see the outlines of the twisted and charred trunks, the burnt out vines rolling in parallel lines toward the mountains. It looked as if someone had taken a giant comb, dipped it in black paint, and gently swirled it across a huge canvas. They reached the fig orchard that separated Papa's land from Senor Rodriguez's. Alfonso, Hortensia, and Miguel walked ahead. But Esperanza held back and pulled on Mama's hand to keep her there for a moment. They turned to look at what used to be El Rancho de las Rosas in the distance. Sadness and anger tangled in Esperanza's stomach as she thought of all that she was leaving. Her friends and her school, 
her life as it once was, Abuelita, and Papa, she felt as though she was leaving him too. As if reading her mind, Mama said, Papa's heart will find us wherever we go. Then Mama took a determined breath and headed toward the sprawling trees. Esperanza followed but hesitated every few steps, looking back. She hated leaving, but how could she stay? With each stride, Papa's land became smaller and smaller. She hurried after Mama, knowing that she might never come back to her home again, and her heart filled with venom for Tio Luis. When she turned around one last time, she could see nothing behind her but a trail of splattered figs she had resentfully smashed beneath her feet. Las guayabas, guavas. They emerged from the fig orchard and continued through a pear grove. When they came into a clearing, they saw Senor Rodriguez waiting with a lantern by the barn doors. They hurried inside. Pigeons fluttered in the rafters. Their wagon was waiting, surrounded by crates of green guavas. Did Marisol come, asked Esperanza, her eyes searching the barn. I could tell no one about your departure, said Senor Rodriguez. When the time is right, I will tell her that you looked for her and said goodbye. Now we must hurry. You need the protection of darkness. Alfonso Miguel and Senor Rodriguez had built another floor in the wagon, higher than the real one and open at the back, with barely enough room between, between for Mama Esperanza and Hortensia to lie down. Hortensia lined it with blankets. Esperanza had known about the plan, but now she hesitated when she saw the small space. Please, can I sit with Alfonso and Miguel? Mija, it is necessary, said Mama. There are too many bandits, said Alfonso. It is not safe for women to be on the roads at night. Besides, your uncles have many spies, remember? That is why we must take the wagon to Zacatecas and catch the train there, instead of from Aguas Calientes. Luis has bragged about the engagement to everyone, said Hortensia. Think how ang angry he will be when he discovers you have gone. We cannot take the chance of you being seen. Mama and Hortensia said grateful goodbyes to Senor Rodriguez, then Sid slid between the floors of the wagon. Esperanza reluctantly scooted on her back between them. When can we get out? Every few hours, we will stop and stretch, said Mama. Esperanza stared at the wood planks just a few inches from her face. She could hear Alfonso, Miguel, and Senor Rodriguez dumping crate after crate of guavas onto the floor above them, the almost ripe fruit rolling and tumbling as it was piled on. The guava smelled fresh and sweet, like pears and oranges all in one. Then she felt the guavas roll in around her feet, and Alfonso Miguel covered the opening. If anyone saw the wagon on the road, it would look like a farmer and his son taking a load of fruit to market. How are you, Alfonso asked, sounding far away. We are fine, called Hortensia. The wagon pulled out of the barn and the guava shifted, then settled. It was dark inside and it felt like someone was rocking them in a bumpy cradle, sometimes side to side and sometimes back and forth. Esperanza began to feel frightened. She knew that with a few kicks of her feet, she could get out, but still she felt trapped. Suddenly she thought she couldn't breathe. Mama, she said, gasping for air. Right here, Esperanza, everything is fine. Do you remember, said Hortensia, taking her hand, when you were only five years old and we hid from the thieves? You were so brave for such a little girl. Your parents and Alfonso and the other servants had gone to town. It was just you and me and Miguel in the house. We were in your bedroom and I was pinning the hem of your beautiful blue silk dress. Do you remember that dress? You wanted it pinned higher so your new shoes would show. Esperanza's eyes were beginning to adjust to the darkness and to the pitch and roll of the wagon. Miguel ran into the house because he had seen bandits, said Esperanza, exhaling. She remembered standing on a chair with her arms outstretched like a bird ready for flight while Hortensia fitted the sides of the dress. And she remembered the new shoes, shiny and black. Yes, said Hortensia. I looked out the window to see six men, their faces covered with handkerchiefs, and they all held rifles. They were renegades who thought they had permission to steal from the rich and give to the poor but they didn't always give to the poor and they sometimes killed innocent people. We hid under the bed, said Esperanza, and we pulled down the bed cover so they couldn't see us. She remembered staring straight up at the bedboards, much like the boards enclosing them in the wagon now. She took another long breath. What we didn't know was that Miguel had a big field mouse in his pocket, said Hortensia. Yes, he was gonna scare me with it, said Esperanza. The wagon creaked and swayed. They could hear Alfonso and Miguel murmuring above them. The persistent smell of the guavas filled their noses. Esperanza relaxed a little. Hortensia continued. The men came into the house and we could hear them opening cupboards and stealing the silver. Then we heard them climb the stairs. Two men came into the bedroom and we saw their big boots through a crack in the bed cover, but we didn't say a word until a pin poked me and I moved my leg and made a noise. I was so frightened they would find us, said Hortensia. But Miguel pushed the mouse out from under the bed and it ran around the room. The men were startled, but started laughing. And then one of them said, it is just a raton. We've got plenty, let's go. And they left, said Esperanza. 
Mama said, we took almost all of the silver, but Papa and I only cared that all of you were safe. Do you remember how Papa said that Miguel was very smart and brave and asked him what he wanted for protecting you, his most prized possession? Esperanza remembered, Miguel wanted to go on a train ride. Hortensia started to hum softly and Mama held Esperanza's hand. Miguel's reward, that day-long trade ride to Zacatecas, seemed like yesterday. Miguel had been eight and Esperanza five. She wore the beautiful blue silk dress and could still see Miguel standing at the station, wearing a bow tie and practically shining as if Hortensia had cleaned and starched his entire body. Even his hair was slicked down smooth and his eyes gleamed with excitement. He, he was mesmerized by the locomotive, watching it slowly pull in. Esperanza had been excited too. When the train arrived, all sputtering and blustery, porters had hurried to escort them, showing them the way to their car. Papa took her hand and Miguel's and they boarded, waving goodbye to Alfonso and Hortensia. The compartment had seats of soft leather and she and Miguel had bounced happily upon them. Later, they ate in the dining car at little tables covered in white linens and set with silver and crystal. When the waiter came and asked if there was anything he could bring them, Esperanza said, yes, please, please bring lunch now. The, the men and women dressed in their hats and fancy clothes smiled and chuckled at what must have looked like a doting father and two privileged children. When they arrived in Zacatecas, a woman wrapped in a colorful rebozo, a blanket shawl, boarded the train selling mangoes on a stick. The mangoes were peeled and carved to look like exotic flowers. Papa bought one for each of them. On the return ride, she and Miguel, with their noses pressed against the window and their hands still sticky from the fresh mango, had waved to every person they saw. The wagon jostled them now as it hit a hole in the road. Esperanza wished she could get to Zacatecas as fast as she had that day on the train, instead of traveling on back roads hidden in a slow wagon. But this time, she was buried beneath a mountain of guavas and could not wave to anyone. There was no comfort, and there was no papa. Esperanza stood at the station in Zacatecas, tugging at the second-hand dress. It didn't fit properly and was the most awful yellow, and even though they had been out of the wagon for some hours, she still smelled like guavas. It had taken them two days to arrive in Zacatecas, but finally, that morning, they left the wagon hidden in a thicket of shrubs and trees and walked into town. After the discomfort of the wagon, she was looking forward to the train. The locomotive arrived pulling a line of cars and hissing and spewing steam, but they did not board the fancy car with the compartments and leather seats or the dining car with the white linens. Instead, Alfonso led them to a car with rows of wooden benches, like church pews facing each other, already crowded with peasants. Trash littered the floor and it reeked of rotting fruit and urine. A man with a small goat on his lap grinned at Esperanza, revealing no teeth. Three barefoot children, two boys and a girl, crowded near their mother. Their legs were chalky with dust, their clothes were in tatters, and their hair was grimy. An old frail beggar woman pushed by, them, pushed by them to the back of the car, clutching a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Her hand was outstretched for alms. Esperanza had never been so close to so many peasants before. When she went to school, all of her friends were like her. When she went to town, she was escorted and hurried around any beggars. And the peasants always kept their distance. That was simply the way it was. She couldn't help but wonder if they would steal her things. Mama said Esperanza, stopping in the doorway, we cannot travel in this car. It, it is not clean and the people do not look trustworthy. Esperanza saw Miguel frown as he edged around her to sit down. Mama took her hand and guided her to an empty bench where Esperanza slid over next to the window. Papa would never have had us sit here and Abuelita wouldn't approve, she said stubbornly. Mija, it is all we can afford, said Mama. We must make do. It is not easy for me either, but remember, we are going to a place that will be better than living with Tio Luis and at least we will be together. The train pulled out and settled into a steady motion. Hortensia and Mama took out their crocheting. Mama was using a small hook and white cotton thread to make carpetas lace doilies to put under a lamp or a vase. She held up her work to Esperanza and smiled. Would you like to learn? Esperanza shook her head. Why did mama bother crocheting lace? They had no vases or lamparas to put on top of them. Esperanza leaned her head against the window. She knew she did not belong here. She was Esperanza Ortega from El Rancho de las Rosas. She crossed her arms tight and stared out the window. For hours, Esperanza watched the undulating land pass in front of her. Everything seemed to remind her of what she had left behind. The nopales reminded her of Abuelita who loved to eat the prickly pear cactus sliced and soaked in vinegar and oil. The dogs from small villages that barked and ran after the train reminded her of Marisol, whose dog, Capitan, chased after trains the same way. And every time Esperanza saw a shrine decorated with crosses, flowers, and miniature statues of saints next to the rails, 
She couldn't help but wonder if it had been someone's father who had died on the tracks and if somewhere there was another girl who missed him too. Esperanza opened her valise to check on the doll, lifting it out and straightening her clothes. The barefoot peasant girl ran over. Mona, she said, and reached up to touch the doll. Esperanza quickly jerked it away and put it back in the valise, covering it with the old clothes. Mona, Mona, said the little girl, running back to her mother, and then she began to cry. Mama and Hortensia both stopped their needles and stared at Esperanza. Mama looked across at the girl's mother. I am sorry for my daughter's bad manners. Esperanza looked at Mama in surprise. Why was she apologizing to these people? She and Mama shouldn't even be sitting in this car. Hortensia looked from one to the other and excused herself. I think I will find Alfonso and Miguel and see if they bought tortillas at the station. Mama looked at Esperanza. I don't think it would have hurt to let her hold it for a few moments. Mama, she is poor and dirty, said Esperanza. But Mama interrupted. When you scorn these people, you scorn Miguel, Hortensia, and Alfonso, and you embarrass me and yourself. As difficult as it is to accept, our lives are different now. The child kept crying. Her face was so dirty that her tears had washed clean streaks down her cheeks. Esperanza suddenly felt ashamed and the color rose in her face, but she still pushed the valise farther under the seat with her feet and turned her body away from Mama. Esperanza tried not to look back at the little girl, but she couldn't help it. She wished she could tell the little girl's mother that she had always given her old toys to the orphanage, but that this doll was special. Besides, the child would have soiled it with her hands. Mama reached in her bag and pulled out a ball of blanket yarn. Esperanza, hold out your hands for me. She raised her eyebrows and nodded toward the girl. Esperanza knew exactly what Mama intended to do. They had done it many times before. Mama wrapped the yarn around Esperanza's outstretched hands about 50 times until they were almost covered. Then she slipped a string of yarn through the middle of the loops and tied a tight knot before Esperanza removed her hands. A few inches below the knot, Mama tied another snug knot around all the yarn, forming a head. Then she cut the bottom loops, separated the strands into sections, and braided each section into what looked like arms and legs. She held the yarn doll up, offering it to the little girl. She ran to Mama, smiling, took the doll, and ran back to her own mother's side. The mother whispered into the girl's ear, Shyly, she said, gracias, thank you. De nada, you're welcome, said Mama. The woman and the children got off the train at the next stop. Esperanza watched the little girl stop in front of their window, wave to Mama and smile again. Before she walked away, she made the yarn doll wave goodbye too. Esperanza was glad the girl got off the train and took the silly yarn doll with her. Otherwise, she would have been reminded of her own selfishness and Mama's disapproval for miles to come. Cliqueta, cliqueta, cliqueta. The song of the locomotive was monotonous as they traveled north, and the hour seemed like Mama's never-ending ball of thread and winding in front of them. Each morning, the sun peeked over one spur of the Sierra Madre, sometimes shining through pine trees. In the evening, it set on the left, sinking behind another peak and leaving pink clouds and purple mountains against the darkening sky. When people got on and off, Esperanza and the others changed their seats. When the car filled up, they sometimes stood. When the car was less crowded, they put their valises under their heads and tried to sleep on the benches. At every stop, Miguel and Alfonso hurried off the train with a package. From the window, Esperanza watched them go to a water truck, unwrap an oilcloth, and dampen the bundle inside. Then they would wrap it in the oilcloth again, board the train, and put it carefully back into Alfonso's bag. What is in there, Esperanza finally asked Alfonso, as the train pulled away from yet another station. You will see when we get there. He smiled and a knowing look passed between him and Miguel. Esperanza was annoyed with Alfonso for taking the package on and off the train without telling her what was inside. She was tired of Hortensia's humming and weary of ma watching Mama crochet as if nothing unusual were happening to them. But most of all, she was bored with Miguel's constant talk about trains. He chatted with the conductors. He got off at every stop and watched the engineers. He studied the train schedule and wanted to report it all to Esperanza. He seemed as happy as Esperanza was irritable. When I get to California, I'm gonna work for the railroad, said Miguel, looking anxiously toward the horizon. They had spread pieces of brown paper in their laps and were eating pepinos, cucumbers sprinkled with salt and ground chiles. I'm thirsty. Are they selling juice in the other car, asked Esperanza. I would have worked at the railroad in Mexico, continued Miguel, as if Esperanza had not tried to change the subject, but it is not easy to get a job in Mexico. You need una palanca, a lever, to get a job at the railroads. I had no connections, but your father did. Since I was a small boy, he gave me his word that he would help me, and he would have kept his promise. He, he always kept his promises to me. At the mention of Papa, Esperanza felt that sinking feeling again. She looked at Miguel. He quickly turned his head away from her and looked up, 
hard out the window, but she saw that his eyes were damp. She had never thought about how much her papa must have meant to Miguel. It dawned on her that even though Miguel was a servant, papa may have thought of him as the son he never had. But papa's influence was gone. What would happen to Miguel's dreams now? And in the United States, she asked quietly. I hear that in the United States, you do not, you do not need una palanca, that even the poorest man can become rich if he works hard enough. They had been on the train for four days and nights when a woman got on with a wire cage containing six red hens. The chickens squawked and cackled, and when they flapped their wings, tiny russet feathers floated around the car. The woman sat opposite Mama and Hortensia, and within minutes she had told them that her name was Carmen, that her husband had died and left her with eight children, and that she had been at her brother's house helping his family with a new baby. Would you like dulces, sweets? She asked Esperanza, holding open a bag. Esperanza looked at Mama, who smiled and nodded her approval. Esperanza hesitantly, hesitantly reached inside and took out a square of coconut candy. Mama had never permitted her to take candy from someone she didn't know before, especially from a poor person. Senora, why do you travel with the hens? asked Mama. I sell eggs to feed my family. My brother raises hens and he gave these to me. And you can support your large family that way? asked Hortensia. Carmen smiled. I am poor, but I am rich. I have my children, I have a garden with roses, and I have my faith in the memories of those who have gone before me. What more is there? Hortensia and Mama smiled, nodding their heads. And after a few thoughtful moments, Mama was blotting away stray tears. The three women continued talking as the train passed fields of corn, orange orchards, and cows grazing on rolling hills. They talked as the train traveled through small towns where peasant children ran after the caboose just for the sake of running. Soon, Mama was confiding in Carmen, telling her all that had happened with Papa and Theo Luis. Carmen listened and made clucking noises like one of her hens, as if she understood Mama's and Esperanza's problems. Esperanza looked from Mama to Carmen to Hortensia. She was amazed at how easily Carmen had plopped herself down and had plunged into intimate conversation. It didn't seem correct somehow. Mama had always been so proper and concerned about what was said and not said. In Aguas Calientes, she would have thought it was inappropriate to tell an egg woman their problems, yet now she didn't hesitate. Mama, whispered Esperanza, taking on a tone she had heard Mama use many times, do you think it is wise to tell a peasant our personal business? Mama tried not to smile. She whispered back, it is all right, Esperanza, because now we are peasants too. Esperanza ignored Mama's comment. What was wrong with her? Had all of Mama's rules changed since they had boarded this train? When they pulled into Carmen's town, Mama gave her three of the beautiful lace carpetas she had made. For your house, she said. Carmen gave Mama two chickens in an old shopping bag that she tied with string. For your future, she said. Then Mama, Hortensia, and Carmen hugged as if they had been friends forever. Buena suerte, good luck, they said to one another. Alfonso and Miguel helped Carmen with her packages and the cage of chickens. When Miguel got back on the train, he sat next to Esperanza near the window. They watched Carmen greet her waiting children, several of the little ones scrambling into her arms. In front of the station, a crippled Indian woman crawled on her knees her hand outstretched toward a group of ladies and gentlemen who were finely dressed in clothes like the ones that used to hang in Esperanza and Mama's closets. The people turned their backs on the begging woman, but Carmen walked over and gave her a coin and some tortillas from her bag. The woman blessed her, making the sign of the cross. Then Carmen took her children's hands and walked away. She has eight children and sells eggs to survive. Yet when she can barely afford it, she gave your mother two hens and helped the crippled woman, said Miguel. The rich take care of the rich, and the poor take care of those who have less than they have. But why does Carmen need to take care of the beggar at all, said Esperanza. Look, only a few yards away is the farmer's market with carts of fresh food. Miguel looked at Esperanza, wrinkled his forehead, and shook his head. There is a Mexican saying, full bellies and Spanish blood go hand in hand. Esperanza looked at him and raised her eyebrows. Have you never noticed, he said, sounding surprised. Those with Spanish blood, who have the fairest complexions in the land, are the wealthiest. Esperanza suddenly felt guilty and did not want to admit that she had never noticed or that it might be true. Besides, they were going to the United States now and it certainly would not be true there. Esperanza shrugged. It is just something that old wives say. No, said Miguel, it is something the poor say. 